All right, so <laughs> I'm sitting down for this one. For those of you who joined my Patreon, you know this is where I record the Patreon videos. I'm sitting for this one because we might be here a little while. I spent about 90 minutes <laughs> sitting and doing research and making up lines and then with like 10 seconds left in the deadline we completely overpay for Sam Bennett from Calgary so uh, <laughs> it just blew up like 90% of what I was gonna say so where do we where do we start all right um, we, we let's start with clearly um, Zito and these owners do not feel like we're ready to win now but before that let's actually start with we did not trade Chris Drieger and Drieger's in net tomorrow night, which gives me some hope that Q is starting to get, get it. All right. What didn't we do? What did we do? Well, we did not get Taylor Hall. Taylor Hall went to the Bruins for Anders Bork and a second. So uh, we, we, we paid two seconds for Sam Bennett. And, yes, we paid two seconds because we gave them this year's second, and we gave them last year's second with the Heine Man. Um, I know some people don't think that that was a great pick, but it's two twos is two twos. There's no way around that. So, I wasn't one of the ones that was in on really, you know, big on getting Taylor Hall because... I think the dude is done, obviously. Look, Bork and Hall have two goals this year each, okay? So as far as on the ice production right now, <laughs> it was an even swap. But obviously, we know Hall's a better player. Couple of other things that went down. Savard, that was the one where I thought, that was the player I thought we had the most opportunity to get. Tampa Bay gives up a first, a third, and a fourth, and somehow ends up with only 25% of the salary because there was three teams involved. I'm not going to get into it all. You guys have seen the move. Um, I thought Savard was somebody that could have helped us clearly. We're going to get in the month, or don't worry. And then the other name that was mentioned um, around our parts was Felino, and he goes to the Leafs for a first and two fourths. Uh, not a big need for us. In terms of a, of a of a grinder type of guy, in his you know at this point in his career, that's what he is as a bottom six grinder guy. Um, I don't think we're you know I'm not I'm not upset we didn't get him and certainly not for a first. He's 33 years old. That's that's a heavy price to pay, but that's what teams do when they're thinking it's you know time to win now. All right, let's get a little bit into Gusev here because now you know we added Bennett. You could start looking at some lines, and I had my team all set to go before Bennett, and now we get Bennett, and I'm like, freaking, it looks like, unless Owen Tippett's going to end up on the fourth line, Tippett is going to get screwed over. Um, and I know some of you, that's the point to this video I wanted to say, no matter what I say here, half of you are going to be pissed off and disagree. So cut me some slack there, all right? <laughs> all right. No matter what I say here, agree, like it, dislike me. I, I, half of you are going to dislike it and, and disagree. Here's the thing with Gusev. I, I was doing some research, and, um, you know, he had a decent year with New Jersey last year, but I looked back at his K, KHL days, and in fact, the last year that Dadenoff was in the KHL before he came to us, he was on the same team with Gusev and Kolachuk. Kolachuk, I got it written up. Kolachuk, 78 points. Dadnoff had 66. And uh, Gusev was in the middle with 71. So he was on the same team with those guys. From what it sounds like with Coach, with Q, what he said yesterday, um, you can all but slot Gusev in up there, up top with Barkov, trying to play the whole Dadnoff role. Now, that was a no-brainer, okay? It was, it was no risk, high reward, even if he just turns into, you know, that what Dadnoff was or maybe even a little bit less. He's still young. He's still got some, you know, some opportunity to, you know, give us some, give us some good years. And 
look, we've had trouble finding guys to fit right in here on the top line. Now, obviously, it is certainly an upgrade over Marchment. We didn't give anything up to him to get him, so I'm happy with that move. Let's, let's get into defense. Montour. Now, before, before we got Montour, I had spoken to a few people who I consider to have high hockey knowledge, IQ, and they liked him. They felt like he was a kid that we could get that would be helpful, and they felt like, um, you know, he's somebody that wasn't getting a, a, a real good opportunity. So I took a look. Now, Montour, you know, as soon as we got him, everybody started bringing out the statistics, you know, especially the analytics and everything, and saying, you know, he's crap. I'll wait to see him on the ice. What I did notice, and I know plus minus isn't really hugely indicative, but in this case, I thought it was worth mentioning because at one, one year, he was plus 16, and then the next year, he was minus 16. And then last year, he was plus 13, and this year, he's minus 13. Those are some pretty big jumps. So it, it sounds to me like either he's completely being inconsistent or he's getting switched around with different partners and, 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 and getting moved around to where he can't, you know, he's not playing the same way on a consistent basis. The problem is, you look at our, you know, when Ekblad went out, then this is the thing that that really, really bums all of us out. You know, we, we when Ekblad went out, we all obviously cringed and knew that that took a huge, you know, a huge nut out of our chances for this year. And we started off being okay with it, right? I mean, you know, Forsling is not Ekblad, but he wasn't really killing us defensively. We, and, and our biggest problem, obviously, is the power play. So you're looking at the pairings now, and with what we did, I mean, you know, Uyghur and Forsling basically are our top pair. You put Gudis with Montour as our bottom pair, or our second pair, and then that bottom pair, unfortunately, oh, I have to say Yandel. I have to say Yandel because he's going to play. I mean, if, if if Q nuts up and benches him, I will, I will, I will kiss his ass, literally. Okay. Um, the odds of that happening though are pretty slim. So Yandel's going to be on that bottom pair. Now I my um, I would like to see Kanaden or Nutavara. On that bottom pair, um, I looked at Kanaten's stats, and, you know, it seems like he does better the more opportunity that he has to play. The, game, the years that he's had some opportunity to play, he's actually had some decent offensive numbers as well. So I would probably rather see him in there with Yandel than anybody else, but if we put in Nut, that'd be okay too. Uh, but defensively, we didn't... I mean, this keeps us from having to put Kirsted and Keeper out there on the ice and maybe stops that rotation. We certainly got rid of the whole 7D thing because now we're overwhelmed with forwards. I'm going to get into that. But, I mean, obviously, did we upgrade the defense considering Ekblad got hurt? Yes, because Montour is still going to be better then rolling out keeper. I mean, the bottom pair the other night was keeper and Kirsten. That's not, I, that's okay. We can't do that. So was it a big upgrade? No. Um, did we give up a lot to get them? No. It's it's a little bit of help. It's a little bit of help. We weren't going to replace Eggblad, and you know. I think we all wanted something there that really just wasn't wasn't available to happen. It just wasn't going to happen. So what we did forward-wise, you know, we added, I don't want to leave out Walmart, because before we got Bennett, I was pretty comfortable thinking I knew what our lineup was going to be. And now Bennett's a center. 
And we all, everybody's been thinking, you know, we need to, to move Wenberg down to 3C. Now I checked, you know, Bennett's face-off percentage is good. So I'm mean, going to slide him in at 2C and, and um, you know, then move Wenberg down to 3C. Personally, I'd rather see Achari move up to 3C. But I guess down the middle, no matter how you slice it, Probably looking at Barkov, Bennett, uh, Wenberg, and Achari as basically the four centers. And then you've got to figure out, if you're going to put Gusev up top, I'm assuming Gusev with Duclair and Barkov up top. Um, and then that that's going to probably move Rahegi down. So, you know, Huberto, I had wanted to put Rahegi at 2C, but then we got Bennett. So I think that's out the door. So then you're still probably going to either have to make, you're going to put Bennett at 2C, then, you know, you're going to have Huberto, and then you don't know what you're going to do after that because um, you, you got Hornquist, you got Vertrano, right? Uh, we, we, we just paid for Walmart. Maybe he's going to be a scratch. I don't know. So we've got numbers. We've, got, we've at least got numbers now where the fourth line will not be an 18-year-old and a seventh defenseman. So again, is it a massive help? No. Did we improve over what we were doing? Yes. Do I have a problem giving up two twos for Bennett? Here's the trick to that. He's only a restricted free agent. So we have his rights. So we get to test drive him. We've got Lundell coming in next year, hopefully, right? Um, Look, I see people on Twitter saying Bennett sucks, and then I see people saying, you know, Bennett's going to help. Over what we have right now, considering we didn't, you know, considering the situation, you know, I like Lewis Starden, I like Lamico, but, but we're heading into the playoffs here, and I think Bennett is probably a clear upgrade over both of those guys at 3C or wherever we're going to slot them if we're going to put... Wenberg at 3C and put Bennett up too. So did we get better? Yes. A little. We're going to be able to roll four lines now. Let's look at it that way, okay? We will be able to roll four lines because Marchment is going to go from the top line to the bottom line, and he's not a bad player. He doesn't score, but he will, you know, he's he probably going to make an excellent fourth liner, okay? Um... And then we don't know what the hell we're going to do with Owen Tippett. Because unless he's going on the fourth line um, between Gusev and Bennett, you know, there's not room for him there in the top in the top three lines. And that, I know people think, you know, he needs, he needs to play more consistent. And then there's people like me. I said, well, he needs an opportunity. So, well, maybe clearly, in my opinion, overpaid for Bennett. I mean, we gave up more for Bennett <laughs> than than uh, than Boston gave up for Taylor Hall. Maybe we were in on Hall, and he wouldn't wave, wave his no move clause. That's a possibility. Unfortunately, Yandel didn't take up after Hall and wave his no move clause. But here's the thing, and you know. I know a lot of people expect me to be all aggravated and pissed off. Um, we got better. Did we get better to the point where um, we're gonna we have a better chance of winning the of the first round? Uh, maybe. Okay, I'll put it this way: if we play Carolina, it ain't mattering. Okay, we didn't. We're, we there was nothing out there that was going to improve us enough to beat. Carolina. If we draw Tampa or somehow luck into the top seed and draw the Blackhawks or the Predators, I believe this made us better that maybe it helps us win a round. Maybe it helps us win that one extra game because we will now be able to roll, you know, four real NHL lines, not just have a fourth line of whoever Q is pissed off with that day and a seventh defenseman. So just by being able to roll a fourth line for real, um, 
and having enough guys to where we might be able to have, you know, uh, consistency across the lines, find some chemistry with these guys and just stick with it. Um, we did improve a little bit at that point. But here's the thing. There was nothing that we were going to do with, with, it, with since Eggblad got hurt. There's nothing we are going to do with the players that were available now that was going to put us over to where we felt like this guy definitely means, or at least two guys definitely mean that we could beat Carolina. It was Savari going to do it? No. Felino? No. Hall? No. All three of them. And I still don't think we beat Carolina. Or I still don't, on paper, look at it and say, now we definitely got them. All right? Um, that said, I, I think we overpaid for Bennett. I mean, 1-2. One, 1-2 two. One, two would have been enough to give up. Um, you know, I, I don't know a whole hell of a lot about Heineman and other than we picked him second last year. The minor league guys can tell you that. But it's still giving up last year's second and this year's second for a kid that, I think what what's what's his most eighteen goals? Let me look here. Let me let, let's see here. Um, yeah, he scored eighteen goals in fifteen sixteen, and since then it's been thirteen eleven thirteen eight and eight last year and four this year. Um, his faceoff percentage had was has been decent. He had a really good couple of years, and then this year has been just under fifty percent. So. Absolutely a guy that probably could slide in at 3C and be an upgrade over what we're doing right now. But 2-2s? Two um, I don't know. I mean, how much better is he than Wenberg and we got Lundell coming? That's a high price to pay, in my opinion. It almost sounds like a little bit of desperation there where we must have been in on some people and then things didn't go well. Speaking of being in on some people, I'm a little bit surprised considering that Hoffman probably was available for a hell of a lot less than two twos, and he would have helped the power play. Now, I don't know about this kid Bennett and, and how he helps the power play, um, but that was, that's our biggest problem right now. Since Yan or since Ekblad went out, I think it's one for 22. On the power play, Hoffman would have would have definitely fixed that. Now I know all the I know he's not a two-way player and all that crap, but if we're making a real run, Hoffman would have been the guy. Getting Bennett in makes me feel like they're just kind of, you know, fishing around to see if, you know, how he's gonna look for next year and, and maybe he competes for, you know, two, three or three C next year. Um, you know, giving us a little bit of a an extra guy in there in case Lundell's not ready. Overall, not excited. Not excited. You know, um, we cleared all that space, and so let's talk about that a little bit. Jeez. Um, so we cleared out. Three and a half million on Connolly, so we'll save that next year. But we blew out not just I know a lot of you think Borgstrom was not worthy of a first round pick, and that's fine. To be honest with you, I'm more disappointed that we blew out and Stillman. Okay, Stillman definitely had potential. I mean look, Stillman made Strawman look good. I mean, and I don't mean it that way, but I mean the Stillman Strawman pair was like acceptable. It was like decent. I mean right now, you know, we're gonna have Yandel and we don't know who. But that's the other thing. Um, you know, we we've been given Zito all this praise for his offseason moves and he deserves it. We gotta keep in mind here that Q was ready to sit Yandel, okay? at the beginning of the season, all right? And so you know damn well Zito would love to be able to deal him. So Zito is dealing with a $6.5 million albatross that he had nothing to do with. And, and Yandel's value is just basically almost nothing. The only thing at this point Yandel gives us 
is he's blocking Q from putting freaking Forsling on the power play and giving him an opportunity. That's that's my opinion. So, and that's the other that's the opinion of, of a few people as well. So, just like consider our cap is like six and a half million less than everybody else because we're just throwing all this money down the toilet. We can't do anything about it, even if we get a trade partner. Um, we're we're gonna have to give up assets to get rid of them, and then Yandel's got to agree to go, and it's just a disaster. So we can't blame Zito on that because he's stuck with that. And remember, he didn't sign Bob either, and so we, we you know we don't we don't trade Drieger. That shows that they want to try to win now a little bit. Obviously, you know they took that you know that they took offers on on Drieger. I'm sure. And he's getting to start this next game, and I didn't look at the stats, but I mean, you know, you guys know how I feel about it. I, I don't want to get off on it. He's getting to start tomorrow night. I believe that this is right now, this point in the season, is when we are going to see just how much play and pull Q has with this locker room, okay? Um, because... Yandel should be sitting technically, and it's not close that Drieger's been playing better than Bob lately. So are we are we are we out this to win, or are we out this to make guys happy by keeping their streaks alive and playing them because they're the big guy that's gonna make ten million? And that's a whole nother thing because there's nothing we can do. Now does the possibility exist that we cleared up that cap space so we could make Drieger an offer? Maybe. Maybe he, maybe with the flat cap, maybe Drieger figures, you know what, I've got a good situation here. Maybe he stays with us for one more year. And we have the money to sign him. And then, you know, we get another year out of him. That's, that's not out of the realm of possibility. Okay, um, he may feel like if he gets one more year of playing at this level and he gets out of the flat cap era, he may feel like he's going to get a much better contract waiting one more year um, and getting a longer term deal than trying to take that longer term deal now when teams are dealing with the flat cap. Don't discount that possibility. And that three and a half that we cleared up with Connolly might allow us to do that. So I know people were disappointed about the Taylor Hall thing. Uh, look, I'm not all about it. All right, the guy's got two goals. He's been traded like a million times, so there's something there, uh, you know. And the thing with that is that money-wise, anyway, you know, we've talked about it. We've we got Barkov, Huerto, Ekblad, and Bob. Between those four guys, at some point, it's going to be between 35 to 40 million on the cap for those four guys. And right now, that's half the cap. So. You know, Zito is definitely hamstrung by the Bob deal and by the Yandel deal and by the Strawman deal as well, which, you know, we try to get rid of Strawman. So, I mean, he, he's hamstrung a little bit there in terms of what else he can do. And then Ekblad getting hurt, you know, we weren't going to replace him. And there wasn't anybody really out there worth overpaying for that was going to make the difference, like I said, between... You know, could this lineup that we have now beat Tampa? I know most Tampa Bay fans are obviously going to disagree, but I think we have a team now that could go six get six or seven games with Tampa, and depending on our goaltending, have a chance to beat them. All right? Clearly, I think we could fare well against the Predators or the Blackhawks, especially the Blackhawks. I, I would like to avoid Soros completely, if we possibly can. Um, but there was nothing that was going to come that was going to put us over to home, to beating the Canes. And so you, you have to look at that and be honest about it. Now, if Ekblad wasn't hurt, okay, then maybe it would have been worth overpaying for somebody, all right? Um, and certainly, though, if Ekblad doesn't get hurt, you look at the moves we made now, and then you really feel like we reinforce things, right? 
uh, because the power play would be fine. And then, you know, we added, you know, we added two forwards, um, which give us the ability to roll four lines. So if Ekblad wouldn't have been hurt, these moves were excited, okay? If Ekblad doesn't get hurt, we would be excited about these moves, all right? I would be, because that would be the type of thing that would, that would give us an opportunity to put us over the top. But the Ekblad injury pretty much, we all know it. We don't want to say it. You know, we were kind of hoping guys would raise their level of play, and they did for, I don't know, about three or four games. And, uh, oh, I want to just mention one thing. So, you know, I've been talking about how um, the team's personality has been completely different these last couple of games. And correct somebody correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I didn't look, but... I believe that the that's when, when Neandel got benched in the third period. And then it's been the two games since then that the team looks like they're not even playing. Am I right there? Is it is is that how it worked out? I believe that that's accurate. Somebody somebody check on that. Uh, my eyes are pretty beat up right now from doing the research, so I don't I don't want to look. But I believe that might man, maybe that has something to do with it, because we all know the story about the beginning of the season um, where Q, you know, was going to bench Yandel and then not so much. So, look, overall, I know I saw some people that were that are really, really pissed off that we didn't do more. Um, the only thing I... We, we clearly overpaid for Bennett. I mean, you just, that's two twos. You can't give up Bennett. I mean, you can't get Bennett for more than, for more than what you know was paid for Hall. That to me, you know, unless we had seen Heineman enough and um, we're like, yeah, no thanks, we're good. We blew that pick, so you guys can take him. I don't know, but I feel like we overpaid for him. And then Montour, he's gonna be one of those guys you can tell already. That people are either going to, you know, love him and want to give him a chance or just hate him based on his, you know, previous experiences and analytics. I always say I want to wait until I see how the guy fits in with with what we do, okay? Like a Hoffman can go somewhere and, and suck, but with us, it worked. You know what I mean? Or like, you know, Dadnoff was good with us. He wasn't great, but he was good. You know, he fit. And he goes elsewhere and, you know... May not be the same player. So I wait to see. Like I said, I'm thinking we're going to have Gudis with Montour. Um, we'll see how that pair plays. You never know how these guys are going to do until they get paired up together and see what the chemistry is. So other than that, guys, I know, I know a lot of you are disappointed. To me, this just brings the Ekblad injury home and into focus. You know what I mean? Um, that this really just brings that injury just right back up, and you realize that, you know, any opportunity that we genuinely had, you know, I was thinking we were looking like, hey, we've got as much of a chance at a cup as anybody else, and unfortunately, I don't know, I don't think we did much to really improve the power play here. Um, certainly, I don't think we got anybody extra. I mean, Yandel's probably still going to be running that power play one. I don't think Hugh's going to put Forsling out there. I think Forsling's got enough to worry about just being shoved on the, on the top pair. And when we start playing these top teams again, Forsling's a really good player. Don't get me wrong. But, yeah, he was clearly not, you know, he, he's not Ekblad. And he just kind of got thrown up there. And don't leave out. Weger now is not playing the same because he's not able to take as many chances. So he's he's not playing the same. We're not we're not pinching nearly as much with our defense and it's showing up on the scoreboard. And I don't think we solved that problem. I don't know that there was anybody out there except for maybe Hoffman that could have helped us solve that problem uh, to run the power play a little bit differently. We didn't do it. For whatever reason, we didn't do it. So Give Gusev a shot. Like I said, he had 71 points in the same team that Kovalchuk had 78. 
Dadunov had 66. And that's the that was the last year that we pulled Dadunov from the KHO. Give him a shot up there. Better than Mason Marchment on the top line. And I think that sums up the video. It this team is now better than Mason Marchment on the top line. And that's that's what we did. Alright, guys. I hope I didn't leave anything out that you guys wanted me to talk about. Um, appreciate everybody's support. Did another video yesterday up on the Patreon. I had an interview with Pam. Uh, check that out. I appreciate everybody who's joined up over there. I'd love to see a few more people. Um, I'm going to be putting more content over there. The more people that join, more content that I'm going to be able to knock out over there. And i got a couple of other exciting things coming that way. I'm going to be doing another live stream this week. Uh, maybe tomorrow. If not tomorrow, definitely the next game. Um, and then hopefully some point here, if within that time period, I can get live streams figured out so I can do them on Patreon. I think I think doing it this last time on YouTube for everybody, I think I figured out how to do it on Patreon. So I definitely want to um, give thanks to my supporters over there by giving them an exclusive live stream. So that's going to come soon too. All right, guys. Ah, uh, this, this one gave me a headache, man. This one gave me a headache. Not going to lie. I did all that damn research, and then I checked Twitter just at the last second, and everybody was like, Sam Bennett? Who? And I'm like, oh, geez. There goes my whole video, my whole damn lineup. And and uh, there's no room for Tippett. There's just no room for Tippett now. I know it. Q's, Q is in his glory. He's going to get to bench him. And I'll see you guys tomorrow night.